I'm, I'm just delighted to be here uh, with so many old friends, and uh, I just want to thank um, Jim and your company and uh, Hilda for her uh, starting this. Actually, I'm here this year because last year sh uh, she had worked with Brad Efren at Stanford, and uh, the, the title Large Scale Data Inference is really Brad's title on his book, a recent book. Uh, Brad, of course, was the uh, guest speaker, and uh, I've I've worked with Brad for many years, and I, I uh, re appreciate this opportunity and, and welcome to. It's so nice to meet uh, so many friends and uh, former some former students and colleagues and uh, so on. Um, and uh, you're, you're right, uh, Eleanor. I, I am trying to. Uh, I will try again to go back and uh, connect uh, ideas uh, that link um, Bayesian and frequency thinking. Um, I always maintain it's uh, you can be both a Bayesian and a frequentist. I don't see them as opposites. I think think of them thought properly as mutually supportive. And uh, with that, let me start. I'm going to make you work right away. But first, I'll tell you just very briefly. Um, uh, I'm going to build it around the theme of regression toward the mean. I'd rather use a term like that. We all understand what that is, and we know what Galton did. Um, about fathers and sons' heights. Uh, if a father's short, uh, a son will tend to be shorter than average, but not as short as his father, uh, is a probabilistic statement. And conversely, for tall fathers, sons would be not as tall, but still taller than average. And it's paradoxical. People used to think that, uh, with regression toward the mean, that, well, are we all um, just going to get uh, uh, with regression, I mean, all, eventually we'll all just be exactly the same size. But of course, there's variation within and between groups, and there's plenty of that will go on in this analysis, um, where they balance out in order to keep the population heights uh, stable. Uh, when I was at Stanford, I learned uh, from Charles Stein um, about his marvelous theorem, um, how uh, the inadmissibility in three or more dimensions about estimates. Uh, and that was what I would think of as a one-level model, and uh, it built around a loss function. When you get into applications, um, you rarely have the unequal sample sizes, the equal sample sizes that are required uh, to make sense of, um, uh, uh, to make his rule useful. And if you go to unequal variances, you get into paradoxes. The real gain has been the development, I think, in simultaneously of uh, frequentist and Bayesian statistics in their own separate ways of analyzing the two-level uh, model, uh, which is um, uh, which is brought, uh, as uh, Eleanor was saying, uh, uh, important um, uh, has been important for many applications, including in the social and biological sciences. So I'll talk about a few things. I'm going to start you out though by making you do some work. So pay attention to the next panel as I turn. Uh, there's elections upon us, and I'll ask you a question. Um, and then I'll talk about some applications if there's time, but I especially want to talk about what regression toward the mean has to say also about false coverage rates, which people worry about a lot with um, uh, large-scale inference. So, um, uh, here's a question, and this panel needs to be studied, and I'm willing to take a little time. Uh, last year, um, I made a comment at the end of the, um, I was at the same uh, in, inaugural uh, event last year, um, and I made a certain comment, and people didn't follow, so I'm going to try to start out by doing a little better here, uh, but with a different context. So you all know, of course, that there's an election going on, and uh, there are swing states that are vital, and the election happens to be pretty close, as I understand it now. And um, so I want to imagine, this is hypothetical, that at the last minute, just before November 6, well, one of the parties, uh, and you can imagine whichever party you like, uh, has um, surveys taken from two states. And you can see the numbers there. And state A has a relatively small sample of size 100. State B has a, a much larger sample of size 1,000. And you're to ignore all the issues that really come in. Uh, you could assume these are approximately normal distributions, actually binomial and, and um, 
Uh, and those, I've reported for you the two p-values. 59 out of 100 is a p-value of 3.6%. And um, I think I've calculated correctly, but this isn't about that. Uh, in, in B, um, the uh, p-value is 5.7% in the much larger state. And um, the p-values I've calculated are for one-sided tests, and you all know how to do this, but as a warm-up, uh, we take, for example, in State A, there were 59 uh, people who said they liked this particular candidate and uh, out of the 100, and so obviously that's 59%. And to calculate the p-value against the null hypothesis of 50-50, uh, obviously, you subtract from 59, you subtract 60, you've all done this thousands of times, you take the square root near the null of PQ over N, and you get 1.8. Uh, in the other case, you do the same calculation and you get 1.57, that's a smaller Z scale, and so the, the, you then way calculate a p-value by calculating the normal CDF at the negative of uh, uh, these two Z values. And that's how you get these two numbers, the probability of being to the left on a normal of uh, one, minus 1 1.8 is 3.6% uh, uh, and so on. All right, so we have two p-values, and that's all I've told you. These two states are, except I've also told you these are swing states, and there are about nine of them now, and I don't know which ones they are. And I want to ignore the issue of whether some swing states, of course, they do have more they carry more electoral votes than other ones. The question is, you as a statistician um, have been asked to help uh, your, the party that's uh, represented here to decide in which of the, the candidates doing well in both states. Both p-values both p -values are in the strongly correct direction for him. Uh, you're supposed to, uh, however, answer the question, is the leading candidate less likely to win in state A or in state B, or are they equal? And um, I'm going to stop for a minute and let you form an opinion and, or even ask a question if you think something else will be helpful that you don't know. Because if we can get, I'm going to spend the next few panels on this, and if we can get this straight, uh, you'll get the main idea for the whole talk. And then I'll try to stay and uh, I'll give you some theory behind it, and then I'll do more, a little more complicated later. So if you have two p-values and... Uh, there are the two numbers. Uh, which one tells you more about, uh, or do they tell you the same information? And if not, which way does it go? And then I'm going to ask you to vote in a minute. I'll ask you to vote. Um, how many people think the candidate, uh, it's the same candidate in both races, uh, and uh, the party, of course, wants to find out where, if he's in more trouble, they have enough money, perhaps, for media blitz in one of the two states to help the candidate with, their, with the hope of getting them both. And um, so if, uh, if, he's, if he's in good shape in one state but not quite as good in the other, they'll put their money on the other. That might be a motive. Um, and uh, uh, so now I want you to vote. If you think uh, he's more trouble in st state A, which has a p-value of 0 0.036, raise your hand. Getting a lot of hands there, okay. I don't mean by a lot, uh, not half or anything. If you think he's in more trouble in state B, raise your hand. I'd say it's damn near tied. And raise your hand if you didn't vote. All right, hey, yeah, this is the best audience I've ever had for this. Uh, you, almost everybody voted. <laughs> um, now, um, anybody want to say something about why? Or shall I move on and tell you what happened? First of all, some of you might have figured out it's a trick question, right? Uh, one p-value is less than 0.05 and the other is larger. Um, <laughs> why would I be asking you if, if that's the obvious answer? Um, okay, so let's... Uh, Let's move. I'll tell you the answer, I think, and, and I'm hoping to discuss it in, um, throughout the day. It has to do with regression toward the mean. Um, in, the, in state um, A, the small state, uh, the candidate got 59 out of 100. That's 59 percent. Now, the information I gave you, and I didn't emphasize it, is these are swing states. There are plenty of states where a candidate's probably going to get 59 percent, one of the two. There's some 
very red states or some very blue states. Um, but the swing states, and there are nine of them, are highly contested, and nobody expects anybody to win by much, and they're all fighting like crazy, as you know. Um, so that's a stretch to think that the candidate might get 59 percent. Not impossible, but it would be surprising. Uh, the November 6th, uh, uh, and I've done some data analysis uh, based on current polls in these states, which are being intensively studied. Uh, the state uh, winners are quite likely to get under 59 percent. Now, we expect, and whenever you have a situation where the estimate is quite unlikely uh, to get 59 percent, 59 percent probably is quite likely, but 59 or more percent would be quite unlikely in a swing for either candidate, uh, winning candidate, to get over 59, uh, would be quite unlikely. And so when that happens, you expect regression toward the mean. There's a much better chance that when we count all the voters in the state, which might be millions, uh, that the actual state vote will be less than 59 percent for the candidate, possibly even less than 50 percent, of course, or then it will be that they get even more than this particular one. However, the state that um, had 52.5 uh, percent, that's not so unreasonable. So you expect a lot of regression toward the mean when the estimate is just higher than you can believe. Um, and right now I'm talking about belief, and we know a lot about this, which is why I picked this example. As the day moves on, I'll talk more about how you can estimate and large, how large-scale inference works. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, introduce something very simple, simply calculated, called a p-value with regression toward the mean. That's down near the bottom. And it turns out for state A, when we evaluate that, the p-value is closer to 10%. And the p-value, uh, it, sorry, the p-value for RTTM, that adjustment. And in, in both cases, the p-values uh, become less strong, but the 5.7 percent holds up pretty well. It becomes 6.6 percent. .6%. And if you compare the 10.2 to the 6.6, .6, the 10.2 is the state in which the candidate will have the most trouble. So that's where you'd want to spend the money. Now remember, we're not, he's not, the job is not to win by a big margin. The job is to win... Uh, 50, 50 point, you know, one more vote than 50 percent. Okay, now I, and I will turn to a bunch of things to uh, try to bring that about. So uh, in a swing state, um, uh, this is just the simple uh, frequentist approach. Uh, you can think of testing hypothesis, and the 3.6 percent, I'm in state, uh, state uh, A here with 100 votes. Uh, this is the scale to which it's drawn. Uh, the, but I've put it on a Z scale, which means I've, I'm not talking about the null hypothesis being 0.5. I've subtracted 0.5 divided by the standard deviation. So the Z scale is the familiar normal 0, 1 scale. We draw a normal 0, 1 under the null, and uh, we shade in the area to the right of 1.8, and that's where we got the 3.6 percent based on a normal curve. Um, or another way of looking at it, which is a Bayesian way that's just equivalent, but is to reverse the thing, uh, draw the likelihood function, which is the dashed line, which is centered at the uh, estimate 1.8, and draw and calculate the probability of being less than or equal to zero, which is equivalent to 50 percent. And that's exactly the same area, because it, you could just take the first graph, uh, the solid graph, and flip it. And there's still 3.6 percent here. All right, so that's okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, that would say the probability is equal to the p-value if you have just no clue about what will happen if the candidate, uh, other than the, the data you have in your hand, the 100 you have in your hand, you have nothing, no idea. But these are swing states. We know something. All right, so um, uh, I'm going to introduce a little notation and then come right back to a, a picture in a minute. We're going to be drawing this red curve. Maybe I'll just tell you what's going to happen for right now. Because um, uh, it turns out that when we think about what it uh, likely values, we're going to get a third curve, a red curve. It's you know, superimposed. And what I'm going to be looking, and that will be our uh, actual belief when we use the fact that we don't expect wild win. This is based on a, what I'll call a 60 percent threshold meaning I think it's very unlikely that either candidate would get more than 60 percent of the vote in a swing state. Um, combined, of course, 
by Bayesian methods with um, the um, data to produce this third curve, which is narrower and to the left. This one actually shrinks 50% of the way from the estimate 1.8 down to zero. That estimate is 0.9 in the middle, but it's thinner because the posterior variance is lower. Uh, the shrinkage model will have uh, a smaller variance. And if you calculate the probability the candidate loses, the way we did with the Bayesian, I'm sorry it's so shaky here, uh, the probability was this dark, uh, the black area, but it's the same region, but under the red curve, there's more probability, and there's the 10 percent that uh, chance where the candidate loses. Now, I haven't drawn the same graph here for the other state, but it doesn't move so much. Uh, so is that all it says? And I, I wrote down the wrong value there. That was supposed to be 3.6, where it says 4.4. State B's estimate of 52 percent is well within the believable range. So it's highly unlikely that the state would ever exceed 59%. In fact, 59% uh, is um, uh, on the red curve. You could actually calculate it. The probability to exceed 59% would be the right. I haven't shaded it there. But it would be um, uh, maybe 20% chance of the, of the actual state voting in that state. At the actual election, 20% chance that it might get larger than... 59, if you believe my threshold was 60%. I'd have to look ahead for a second, yeah. I don't know if, uh, I guess I've got to give you a little theory, so I'm backing up to give you a little theory. Uh, we have a random effect called Y bar at the top, and it's, um, it's the true value mu that we're wondering about. Mu would be the percentage of votes that candidate gets in the final election, plus measurement error, which is just, in this case, given by binomial standard deviation with mean zero binomial standard deviation. Um, and uh, then, if, but we have a two-level random effects model. Uh, there's a prior mean uh, mu zero in the random effects, which I'm taking right now to be 50%, uh, that that's sort of what we think might happen, but with some variation tau, which is the standard deviation of the random effect. This two-level random effect model I consider to be as just as frequent as is Bayes, and probably it was introduced originally by frequentists, and you're interested often in estimating mu zero and tau, or you might be interested in estimating, um, well, in, in uh, uh, estimating mu itself. And uh, if you want to estimate mu itself, uh, we look down at the bottom. We need a shrinkage factor, which I'll, I can call in this language expected regression toward the mean. It's a proportion uh, of probability that regresses toward the mean. Uh, and it's calculated as the within variance divided by the total, which is within V and between tau square, which we still are thinking about uh, numerically, and I haven't said what tau square is in this calculation. Um, and 1 minus B is called the credibility. I'm calling it that name because actuaries like that name. They introduced it 100 years ago almost. Uh, is how much credibility you give to the firm or the data from the firm itself and so they think just the opposite of shrinkage. You can be an actuary if you can remember one thing. One minus uh, shrinkage factor equals credibility. Otherwise, the theories are the same. Um, so I have at the bottom that yeah, shrinkage plus credibility adds to one. We're at the bottom. And so you put uh, credibility weight on the data and shrinkage weight on the uh, prior mean, which is like 50%. And... Um, uh, now we have to pick a threshold. Usually, in large data sets, the big advantage you have is that um, with uh, very large data is if you can do enough modeling, and I think we're going to hear uh, Rob Cass, I know, give a nice uh, rendition of this, uh, and we'll, uh, I think, later today. Um, uh, you have enough information to estimate all of this because you're doing a lot of modeling. Uh, I haven't done the modeling right now. We've just been doing some thinking. Uh, but the models, uh, if you do this simple thinking, you sort of learn what you have to do for the models, and then you have to have a lot of uh, mathematical, probabilistic, science, uh, statistical, and computer skills maybe in a complicated data set to take advantage of all of that. Plus, you have to check your models and so on. Uh, but the formula is the p-value for regression toward the mean is just almost as simple as the p-value. Um, that is... Um, the p-value would be the normal CDF at minus z. That's what we calculated before. Now you calculate the credibility, uh, and uh, you take the square root, 
and you reduce z by that factor, and that will be your probability. Uh, that acts as a probability, but it's more like there's really a 10% chance that the null hypothesis or less is, um, uh, has been achieved. So when we make these decisions, we say the p-value is 3.6%. A lot of people, I included, often think that means there's only a 3%, there's only a 3%, 0.6% chance that whatever it is I'm rejecting is actually true. But that's not the case. And I'm trying to tell you, if you think about RTTM, this is a central message, um, and you make these kinds of adjustments, you'll get a more accurate uh, estimate. Uh, but in any event, if you, you can, most people can recognize RTTM. They know when an estimate is too unbelievable. So just look at that estimate. Now, with luck, um, we're back here again, and I pretty much already said what's here. So the central curve, I just introduced some shrinkage factors and so on. The shrinkage factor is how we got, uh, we shrunk the estimate 1.8 down towards 0, 50%. It was 50% shrinkage in that example. Uh, the tau value was uh, halfway toward the two standard deviations I said to achieve the threshold. And uh, if 0.5 is the mean and that we're regressing toward, and 0.6 is our sort of highest believable actual amount, then tau is just half of that, because that's two sigma. I'm just saying roughly there's two and a half percent higher. Um, on either end, by the way, so it's five percent overall. And so you shrink this much, you reduce the variance by the square root of the credibility, that's a standard deviation, and you draw another normal curve, and now you do all the calculations using the red curve. And the 10 percent, as I said, was that area under that triangle. Um, I'll just, I only have to say one thing from this table. The yellow is what we just went over. Uh, in particular, that was when the uh, threshold of 60% was sort of the highest value I would believe. I actually believe it's more like 55%. I bet you neither of these candidates ever gets more than 55% in the nine swing states. If it's 55%, uh, the p-value gets adjusted to 21%. Uh, so the candidate has that chance of losing. But for 1,000, uh, it would be 9%. Notice that they're both getting larger, but uh, this one has moved a lot less uh, than this one. This was statistically significant. But when you take it to the standpoint of a journal article, it's demonstrated something like this in an example like this. Uh, you're saying, well, one guy gets to publish his paper because his p-value is less than 5%, and the other guy didn't. But the actual thing is, is uh, maybe neither of them should be, but if either, it should be the one based on 1,000 here. And I could have picked the numbers, uh, obviously quite differently. And as tau gets large, um, if, if you really believe uh, that the threshold, uh, it wouldn't surprise you if much if either candidate got 97% of the vote. That's like, I don't know what's going on. And then the p-values, which I've listed in this here, 3.6, hardly move. And this. So it's not that they're totally wrong. Um, it's that, uh, uh, now I really need to keep, I have 10 minutes to finish, you know, I always tell my students, don't, Joey, Val, don't plan too long a talk. So I'm going to skip all this stuff right now. You're going to see it flash by you. Shrinkage with unequal variances, uh, where you can have hospitals and I hope you all know about this. This is multi-level model. Now I'm moving away from just estimating something from our brain and past data. I'm estimating something where this is just 31 hospitals and how you evaluate hospitals with shrinkage models. And you can get rather different answers because you have crossover effects. That's all you need to know. Here's a hospital didn't treat many people, and they had a bad estimate. But after sh through shrinking, it's just that they had a bad, out bad outcome with very little data. And other hospitals had a lot more data, and uh, so they, they still move in this example. These are New York hospitals uh, some years ago. Um, here's another example. I'll just, it's just worth saying a second about. Uh, not my work, uh, but uh, here's bladder cancer rates for men in the United States over a long period in, uh, in a 30-year period. or No, actually a 10-year period. Uh, some years ago, this is... Um, done by uh, Reagan and uh, others. And, uh, using, but using Poisson modeling, they did shrinkage. Well, there's 3,000 counties here in the United States. 
And all the dark areas look like they're kind of rural, if you know how the United States works. So the, you make up a quick story. Ah, oh, rural. That's it. They're, they use bad fertilizers and things in, in small counties. Or if you shrink the data, you begin to realize what really happened was there wasn't much data here in the unequal variance problem. Uh, in the counties that only had you know, one bladder cancer case, but they only counted 10 people, would stand out high on a raw scale estimate, but be shrunk hard because we know the probabilities. Uh, this is using various neighborhoods, and they shrunk together. And now you notice the dark areas appear in more urban settings. So now suddenly you think it's all the bad things about living in urban areas that cause bladder cancer. Uh, the, the interesting point is, for example, I, I was from L.A. when this was going on, and uh, it looked like L.A. is in good shape here. And oops, maybe you don't want to live in L.A. And actually, this estimate is lower than this estimate. It said L.A. has a lot of data, and they didn't shrink much. They shrunk a little bit. And these two scales are very different because they're shading in in this picture only the highest, uh, I don't know, 10 percent or sort of of the regions. And here they're uh, the highest 10 percent. But the highest 10 percent here are much, much smaller. The, the scale factor is about a factor of 12 between these two. So you've got to read these graphs really carefully. And um, one last thing I do have to say is, since I'm talking about frequency Bayes unification, at least before I jump to the final part, is um, uh, this is a, one of my favorite graphs that Cindy Christensen and I worked on years ago. Uh, it had to do with heart transplant data. And um, if you don't want to be a... Um, uh, if you want to be a good frequentist, you often think up methods, and they're widely used, and uh, create confidence intervals uh, for the two-level model. In this case, they're Poisson data. And the standard frequentist ways of proceeding, uh, let's see, um, like, well, even using uh, Riemel methods, uh, restricted maximum likelihood, uh, this curve, uh, the nominal rate is at the 5% line here. Uh, that is 95% of the time you're supposed to cover, 5% of the time uh, you're allowed not to cover, and the nominal rates for the, in the data that we looked at was, were on the order of 30% uh, non-coverage for this widely used procedure, which only involved uh, 15 hospitals. Uh, another method, uh, generalized linear models for the two-level model, all based on asymptotic things, except asymptotic doesn't take care of some of the smaller sample concerns, uh, still uncovers, uh, depending on the covariate, maybe a lot or maybe a lot less, but always more than 10 percent. Now, if you want to be a good frequentist, you'll do that. If you want to be a Bayesian with a fairly flat prior, you can pull in the bugs program, which has this amount. Or the procedure we call PRIM, which is an acronym for uh, Poisson Regression Interactive Multilevel Modeling, and uh, which kind of hugs the 0 0.05. So we get the advantage of shrinkage, uh, but we also pay penalties for not knowing exactly how much to shrink. That's built into the, uh, the width of the intervals. And, uh, and uh, so the Bayesian methods, and this whole thing is done by frequency standards. This is a big simulation. And we're talking about uh, not the probability of covered. We're, we're talking about the confidence, the, the, the actual estimated confidences. So I'm just saying that uh, if, if data sets are not large, there can be differences between frequency and Bayes. And it can happen if you're careful with your prior, uh, level two hyperparameter prior, that you'll do better as a frequentist if you use Bayesian methods. And that's the harmony I'm looking for for the two things. All right. Well, the last one I wanted to talk about was uh, last year, Brad Efren talked a lot about Benjamini and Hochberg's uh, false discovery rate. But uh, there's been new work for which ben Benjamini was just honored this summer with a medallion lecture called False Confidence Rates. And uh, what he does is notice quite correctly that if you have a null hypothesis that you reject and you only report your intervals after rejection, that those intervals tend not to cover, and, and uh, that was, and, and I'll help you see why in the next couple of minutes. And um, uh, then uh, you get, but if you get you get the estimates for the intervals that have been rejected, and then uh, if you draw the usual interval, it won't cover with high enough probability. 
So uh, Bonferroni methods and other methods that build on that that Benjamini has developed widen those intervals so that they do cover enough, and that's mathematically correct. But what should be done is, uh, did I just do that again? What should be done is um, a, a bit different. So I'm drawing, uh, in this case, suppose you rejected with a z value of 3. And here's the null hypothesis. I'm doing the same thing I did a few minutes ago. But uh, here's, uh, or at the estimate 3, you could draw the likelihood function. And usually you'd make the estimate at 3, and you'd add and subtract almost two standard deviations. And this blue rectangle tells you how wide it is. Um, and that would be the standard thing. And I'm going to show you now what's wrong with it. And rather than show you the numbers, I'm just going to draw the red curve that's appropriate for this uh, because you can assess the regression toward the mean. And with that and other tools I've just talked about, the regression toward the mean lets you draw the red curve. Now, the blue curve we just saw, it led to the blue interval. The red curve is for shrinkage. It's narrower, and you can tell from its height they all integrate to 1. It's narrower, uh, but it's been shrunk. The new estimate is, is not 3 over here. It's about 2.1. And the interval's narrower. And if that's the correct interval, what's the probability now going back of the standard, estim uh, the standard interval? The standard interval is still this blue rectangle. The probability that the blue rectangle, which is intended to be 95%, uh, the probability you fall outside under the correct curve, I'm calling it the correct curve, is uh, this, this shaded area in red. And the shaded area in red turns out to be, uh, I guess it must be about 20. That doesn't sound, well, anyway. The shaded area in red, I'm saying here, it only has 74% uh, coverage. I want to check that number. It's definitely too low. So uh, Bonferroni's right that they undercover. This proves Bonferroni's right that they undercover. But it also shows you how to correct it. You should not be, as Bonfroni and um, uh, Benjamini, you should not be, uh, when you do the correction, you don't hold the mean where it always has been and calculate a wider interval to make sure you've covered. You allow the mean to move toward, regress toward the mean, and then you get a narrow interval. So you actually get a narrow interval. You'll save information, and you... Uh, um, uh, and, you'll, and you'll get the correct coverage back with a narrow interval. It sounds like a great reward. Uh, you make the interval a lot shorter if you center it at the right place and get the right reward. And I think I better move into wrap-up. Is that right, uh, Hilda? Uh, to summarize as best I can, on the frequency Bayes unification, uh, I don't see them as competing. I see them supporting each other. Um, the first bullet says, uh, if you expect RTTM, regression toward the mean, in your data, just by thinking about it, if you see estimates that look too big, or un not terribly too big, but it, it may be more due to the randomness. You may have found the one time in the 5% where the, um, uh, it, it's really just too big because of the randomness that you're allowing for and not because there's something real, or at least it needs to be moved. It needs to be regressed toward the mean, not put all the way back to zero. In large-scale data, uh, you can often, uh, you don't have to judge these priors, as I've been saying. You can use various methods, empirical bays and so on. Rather sophisticated things have been done. Um, I wanted to mention, actually, then the false coverage rate that uh, there's a new paper just came out, got mailed to us yesterday or something, JRSSB, where um, uh, Wong and Zhao have a paper that goes through lots of the math on how to really do this. Thing. So I want to point out their paper, which is in total agreement with what I'm doing here. Um, I want to mention the Herman Chernoff uh, uh, quote. Uh, Chernoff, have you ever heard of Chernoff faces? Seems to me he's one of the first real data visualizers in the sense of many people did before, Playfair and so on, but uh, with computers. He drew faces. So anyway, but it's uh, Chernoff's quote. He's, Chernoff says he's a frequentist. He sits down the hall from me, and I've known him for many years. Uh, he's, he's a dyed-in-the-wool frequentist, but he says, if you don't understand a problem from a Bayesian perspective, uh, and, he says, a decision theoretic perspective, 
then you don't really understand it well enough. Um, so he always does that, even though he ends up being a frequentist. Um, so uh, I, uh, I think the, the correct, uh, uh, w one correct way for a frequentist, at least, to be Bayesian, and certainly Bayesians can be personalistic too, but if a frequentist should think about Bayesian construction much more often and learn from that, I would say Bayes, is, Bayes theory is one of my best teachers as a frequentist. But uh, then, of course, uh, do frequency evaluations to decide if um, your procedure, at least if it's not a one-off procedure, if it's a general procedure, to decide if it works. And this little picture here is the frequency Bayes football. If you know me, you know I like doing sports data. Sometimes I draw laces in that football. Um, but at any rate, um, Joe uh, um, Blitzstein and I use this as our logo for our, our course at uh, Harvard on statistical thinking, uh, the intro to mass stat. And with that, I don't know what time it is, but I will stop. Uh, okay. So thank you. <laughs>